Ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning. Welcome and thank you for joining this morning's webinar titled Striving for Stability, a Multilateral Recovery from the Pandemic, jointly organized by Business China and the SICC. More than two years ago, the world as we knew it went into disarray and our lives were disrupted when the COVID-19 pandemic first hit. Today, the world struggles to recover from the repeated disruptions caused by waves of the coronavirus and intensifying competition between the world's superpowers. When we thought things were looking up at the beginning of this year, the Russia-Ukraine war sent oil and commodity prices soaring and threatened already unstable supply chains. Recent tensions over the Taiwanese Straits also added to the geopolitical turbulence. Earlier this year, Analysts and observers were hopeful that Beijing's push for stability, as emphasized during the annual Liangkui in March, would support global econo economic recovery and growth, together with fast-growing Asian markets and strong US labor market. Now that almost six months have passed, are we still on track? Deglobalization, bifurcation, and digitalization. With these forces at play, we are arguably in an age of turbulence. Hence, amidst the turbulence, what can we do in our pursuit for stability and growth? Amidst the many questions in mind, what are some of the key trends and policies that we can actually be certain of? What are the bright sparks that we can look forward to? Hopefully, insights from our panelists today can provide some answers and illuminate our minds. At this point, allow me to share a little bit about Business China. Business China is a nonprofit organization launched in November 2007, witnessed by Singapore's founding prime minister and Business China's founding patron, Li Kuan Yew, and then premier of the People's Republic of China, Wen Jiabao. As the brainchild of Mr. Li Kuan Yew, Business China was envisioned to be a body that cultivates Singaporeans to be bilingual, and bicultural so as to sustain our multicultural heritage and to develop a cultural and economic bridge connecting the world and China. To this end, Business China offers a wide range of programs with the aim of enhancing members' Singapore-China savviness and building strong Singapore-China networks. A key program offering that we have is our signature Future China Global Forum. It is an international platform of business leaders and experts around the world to share their experiences and analysis of the new trends and forces driving China's evolution to becoming the world's largest economy. This year, the Future China Global Forum will take place on the 7th of October, themed Stability Amidst Turbulence. Hence, today's webinar is a great lead up to the much anticipated forum, and I would warmly encourage all of you to come and check us out. Finally, I'd like to thank SICC for the wonderful support and partnering Business China in making this webinar possible. I would also like to thank our speakers, Jishin, Eugene, and Selena for making time to share your insights at this webinar. With that, let me hand the time over to Victor. Thanks, Peiling, and good morning, everyone. And on behalf of all of us at SICC, welcome to this webinar which as Peiling says is a prelude in many ways to Business China's flagship conference, the Future China Global Forum, which will be held next month. I want to pay tribute to Business China Singapore for all the work it does to enable greater understanding of not only a remarkable and very complex country, but also to improve and strengthen relations between Singapore and China and between their respective business communities. The world we live in today is so complex and yet so bifurcated, so polarized in many respects. And it's organizations like Business China Singapore, which bring perspective and insight and knowledge to help us in the business community understand the world's second largest economy, and very shortly, as Paling says, 
the world's first largest economy. Without further ado, uh, I want to hand you over to Nicholas Fang, who will introduce a panel that is impressive, not only in its breadth and depth of knowledge and insight, but in its passion for understanding and growing understanding between Singapore and China. Nicholas uh, needs no introduction. He's one of Singapore's most able, astute and intelligent moderators, and it's a pleasure to have him with us today. So Nicholas, over to you and everybody, please enjoy uh, this, this wonderful webinar. Take full advantage of the Q&A function, and uh, we look forward to learning and understanding together. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Victor, and of course, Peiling as well for doing such a great job of introducing the topic uh, and the focus areas today. I don't really have much of a job left to do. Victor, thank you very much for the kind words right at the end there. It always throws me uh, when you say such, such kind things. I've never thought of myself that way, but I am very, very grateful to both Business China and SICC for the opportunity to be here today to moderate a, a very exciting and dynamic panel and of course to learn from the insights of our very, very learned panelists. Um, you see their names up on the screen right now. I just want to uh, very quickly introduce um, Mr. Eugene Ng, who is the General Manager Director for Sales and Marketing, overseeing the Asia Pacific region at Chevron Oronite. Uh, we have Ms. Selena Ling, whom many of you will know from her frequent media uh, appearances as well. She's the Chief Economist Head of Treasury Research and Strategy and Global Treasury at OCBC Bank. Uh, and, and last but definitely not least, uh, Mr. Fu Jishun, who is Global Managing Partner at GGV Capital. Uh, and as Pei Ling uh, mentioned, also a board member of Business China. So it's wonderful to have such a diverse range of panelists who can offer perspectives uh, on, on China uh, from Singapore and the region and also from the Americas as well. Now, uh, Peiling has already touched on some of the key issues and focus areas and trends that we are seeing uh, in the region today. And I think that if you look at the title of the webinar, in, in essence, it captures some of the complexity and diversity of the issues and topics that we will explore today. Uh, we're going to look at striving for stability, as well as in the context of a multilateral recovery from the pandemic. And there's really quite a lot to unpack just in that one title alone. Um, I propose that uh, I will allow the uh, panelists to have an opening uh, remarks uh, surrounding the broad thrust of the, type, the, the webinar as encapsulated in the title, but potentially also exploring, and it's a good starting point, some of the challenges that we have faced and currently are facing uh, as a result of the pandemic. And potentially in our discussions, we can talk a little bit about the recovery and the way out of this. Uh, and how multilateralism might actually play into that. Um, I propose that uh, we start with ladies first, uh, as always. So, Selena, if I could invite you for your opening thoughts uh, on the topic today um, and touch a little bit on potentially some of the challenges that you think all of us face uh, as a result of the pandemic and the current situation. Selena, over to you. Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and my thanks to SICC and also for Business China to invite me to this panel. Uh, okay, let me start with some of my key thoughts here. We do live in very challenging times. I mean, if you look at the financial market volatility, it tells you that there are many, many themes that is uh, at the top of mind. We, apart from the pandemic, obviously now people are grappling with inflation and also how to navigate this challenging environment where there are a lot of shades of geopolitical uncertainties, uh, economic recovery that is taking place at very uneven uh, levels across the different economies. And I think increasingly, you know, these issues about um, food security, energy security, and uh, also with time, whether we're going to get a new virus X. I think sitting out here in uh, Asia, especially in Singapore, um, it could be the best of times and the worst of times. Why do I say that? If you look at the world at large, you know, there's a lot of uh, talk about recession risk for the major economies like the US, for Europe, for UK, uh, a risk of a hard landing or a harder landing in China because of what's happening with the property market. But in ASEAN, actually, the silver lining is that a lot of the reopening is taking place. 
we are seeing some normalization in terms of the tourism flows. But I think going ahead, um, you know, we have to bear in mind that a lot of the headwinds are still here to stay. And it will be fairly challenging because businesses and economies have to grapple with high inflation on one hand, but also growing growth and demand slowdown on the other hand. Singapore is quite unique um, in that we are trying to capitalize on a lot of the capital flows that's coming into this region. Um, the recent relaxation, I think in particular for some of the labor and manpower measures do put us in a fairly good place to leverage on some of the investments and business coming back to this region. But it is going to be quite tricky going forward. And I'm sure you'll hear from the other panelists about some of the challenges for their specific industry. So maybe I'll just stop here, Nicholas, and hand it back to you. Thank you very much, uh, Selena. And that's a great overview in terms of where we are right now. I think you did a great job of summarizing some very, very tricky issues. And I'm sure uh, we will get into some of the details uh, as we go along. Uh, if I could still stay in a fairly macro view before we start to zoom down into specific uh, industries, I'd like to invite uh, Mr. Fu Jishun at this stage to share some of his views. Uh, Mr. Fu straddles uh, East and Western views, uh, given the nature of his business that sees him uh, uh, moving between the East and the West. So maybe in that context and in broader, more broadly, uh, also this notion of a, of a search for recovery and a search for stability in the region post-pandemic. Um, what's top of mind uh, for you as you as you sort of navigate uh, both sides of the East-West divide, uh, Mr. Fu? Well, uh, thank you, Nicholas. Thanks for, uh, well, thanks SICC and Business China for having me today. It's good to, it's good to be here. Uh, I think Selena has kind of draw, kind of painted the backdrop that we are in today. Um, there, there's the term that I learned uh, that was coined during the Cold War, uh, which essentially suggests uh, it's called VUCA, uh, V-U-C-A. Uh, it's vulnerable. Uh, we are in a very volatile environment, uncertain environment, complex environment, and ambiguous environment. Um, so amidst all these uncertainties, that was the words that I was just describing to, um, you know, I'm, I'm a venture capital. I've been in this business for the last 22 years. Uh, we have about 10 billion under management and we deploy our capital largely across US and China with about 10% in emerging markets. Um, and the, the way we think about things is trying to figure out and understand what are the certainties uh, amidst all these uncertainties? Uh, we are in a difficult climate environment as well as you can tell with all the heat waves and droughts and floods around the world. Um, the, there's much to do in terms of the climate change and there's much to invest in in the climate change. Um, the other thing that is really happening is despite um, everything that we said that is happening around capital markets and volatilities, um, we are seeing good growth in some of our portfolio company. Our medium growth rate is about 40%. Uh, we just ran the numbers very recently. Uh, I'm now in the US and we are uh, meeting some of our investors. So if you look at how these digitization waves is happening, uh, COVID has a two effect. Um, it's, it changes a lot of behavior, it digitizes a lot of behavior as well, particularly in emerging markets. So our deployment in capital uh, to the point that Selena uh, highlight earlier is actually increasing in emerging markets in some of our later funds. Uh, it has increased from 10% to 20%. So that gives you an idea of how we try to identify some of these uh, changes uh, continue to happen and digitization continue to happen. And, um, and try to um, write this uncertainty, if you will, or navigate this uncertainty uh, in, you know, as we talk. So with that, I'll pass back to Nicholas to uh, I'll pause there and then we can discuss more later. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Fu. Of course, uh, great to hear insights and of course, a little bit of updates in terms of where potential growth is uh, from a very practical perspective uh, in the work that GGG GGV Capital is doing. Um, zooming down a little bit into potentially uh, a very key industry uh, and 
hopefully to give us some insight from uh, uh, the sort of uh, industry uh, side of the house. Uh, I turn now to Mr. Eugene Ng uh, to potentially give us uh, some insights, from, maybe from a Chevron perspective, but we could speak more broadly, you know, in terms of the, the broader industry as well. Uh, Eugene, over to you. Might need you to unmute uh, yourself, Eugene, please. Eugene, I'm sorry, you're still muted. We can't hear you. Oh, okay, no worries. Everyone, please bear with us. We heard a little bit earlier from, from Eugene that uh, Zoom is not necessarily the in-house platform of choice uh, for him. So uh, we can understand that. Ah, here we have him now. Eugene, over to you. Okay. We can hear you. It's a little bit uh, uh, patchy, and we've lost your video now. Eugene, are you there? Are you are you able to hear us? Please bear with us, everyone. I think we have mild technical difficulties. We'll give Eugene a couple of minutes to see if he can sort it out. Eugene, can, if you can't hear us, or if you can hear us, um, potentially we, I'll, I'll, what I would like to do is maybe pose a uh, slightly more specific and repeat an earlier question that I had um, to both Selena and uh, Jishun as well, so we can have a bit of conversation while we are sorting out the technical aspects. Um, I'd said earlier that you know the, the pandemic has, of course, created some challenges for us. Um, uh, Selena, you touched a little bit about some of the additional challenges, inflation, and even economic recovery, and the risk of a potential uh, next wave, whether it's a it's a it's a COVID related wave or the next dramatic sort of pandemic. Um, are there anything? Is are there any other challenges you see that uh, companies, individuals in the region might potentially need to uh, start thinking about in the next five or ten year horizon? Uh, that could impact how they start to plan and think about, about business today. Maybe I'll start with Selena first. Okay, sure. Thanks, Nicholas. I think uh, there are a lot of uh, challenges that you know, both uh, firms and countries are grappling with. I mean, if you recall during the pandemic, because of the border closures, um, a lot of the global supply chains uh, will face a lot of bottlenecks. And although some of those bottlenecks have resolved, but I think underpinning uh, you know, some of the longer term challenges really is this idea you know that geopolitical tensions may last longer than what was initially expected if you recall uh, when the biden administration came on board there was uh, high hopes that he'll unwind a lot of the tariffs that were levied on china uh, so far that hasn't happened yet and i think uh, going ahead you know if we are envisaging a very polarized world then this uh, you know diversification uh, strategy is likely to persist uh, we do expect that, you know, um, for a lot of firms, they would be looking at how they can actually fortify and diversify their supplier networks in order to build their resilience. And this is a very similar story for countries as well. You know, I mentioned about food security, energy security, and vaccine uh, security, and all sorts of a whole host of, you know, critical uh, components that one may actually need to continue to survive or even to prosper. I think this actually gives uh, you know, some thought uh, to whether there should be a need for greater uh, reshoring or onshoring type of efforts, especially when it comes to uh, food security. And I think in terms of the energy security side, you, know, you see the Eurozone countries now having a very big rethink about uh, whether they should uh, either restart or hang continue to hang on to some of their 
uh, fuel power plants or even their nuclear power plants. So for countries that uh, are very reliant on uh, overseas energy supplies, Singapore included, um, you know, that really also means that there has to be serious consideration given to how to whether you can actually make sure that you secure the necessary supplies in order to continue to make sure that your economic and industrial activities are not disrupted. And of course, at the current uh, environment, I mean, I sit at the forefront of what's happening in the financial markets, being in the treasury department and bank. And this whole idea that the central banks now are saying, which is that they will continue to fight inflation by tightening monetary policy, by hiking rates. I mean, overnight, we saw the European Central Bank just do 75 basis points. And the Fed, uh, Fed Chair Powell, also hinting that they're going to do the third 75 basis point hike at the upcoming meeting in about uh, two weeks' time. That tells you that we live in an environment where central banks are really uh, obsessed, I would say, with fighting inflation. And come what may, whether it's a growth slowdown or recession, they're going to continue to tighten monetary policy. So that actually puts uh, most of us, whether it's firms or households, in a very uncomfortable position where your revenue stream or your income levels may actually be hit because growth activities is slowing down. But on the flip side, your, fund, your financing, your funding costs will continue to go up. So whether you're you know, servicing your debt or your mortgages, you're going to be paying more out of a wallet that's going to be shrinking. So it is very challenging times indeed, Nicholas. Thank you very much, Selena. I think we have Eugene back with us. So, uh, Jishin, we'll come to you, maybe to address some of the issues that Selena has highlighted and your perspective from uh, East and West again. Uh, but I'm going to now go come back to Eugene and see if we can get him to share some opening thoughts. Yeah, thanks, Nicholas, and all the First of all, I want to thank the uh, and for inviting me to this webinar. At the same time, thanks to the participants for being here. Thanks to for joining this uh, webinar. So, um, sorry to let you know, so I want to go out know, my opening. Hopefully, we are kind of blending well with the rest of the conversations that uh, the other speaker have talked about. Uh, just a quick um, in the terms of share so that you have better appreciations uh, for the conversation later we will have. So, share online is the theory of share cooperation, which, which is the integrated energy company that produces uh, most of our fuels and uh, fuels, and we produce uh, additives, right? Uh, actually, chemical additives. Um, and Chevron, the uh, all night uh, has been in this business for hundred more than hundred years, or in fact hundred and five years. So through this journey, as the as time we walk, right? So with the with, with that, and then um, you know over the last twenty to thirty years, uh, Chevron all night have put a significant emphasis uh, in terms of growing in Asia, uh, and in fact Asia grew. Um, a good option for the share of online profitabilities. So the background is that we continue to see in Asia as a strategic growth market, especially China, uh, that uh, you know, we want to invest in. Uh, I think there's other speakers that mentioned about you know, the turbulence, the, um, the uncertainty we are facing, uh, that we all together are facing. So what is important for us is to from uh, our point of view, it's really that we need to be watchful, continue to really uh, consciously optimistic in our investment. So we we continue to want to uh, kind of uh, like, you know investment plan it, but at the same time uh, we need to face ourselves right. So the key word is face and be selective. Okay, in terms of what we invest, how we invest, when we invest, right. Uh, in fact, you know, during and, and the backdrop is really, you know, over the last few years, although we have gone through pandemic and uh, the society you know, challenges, and at least in our industry, natural disasters that, you know, probably some of them heard the taxes freeze, right? Uh, the winter storm in the US, that causes a very major, you know, kind of negative impact to our industries. 
But even with that, because we have built enough resilience in our systems and supply reliability, we are able to weather through those challenges. Now, don't get me wrong, there are still challenges, multi of challenges, but because we have been continuing to invest in terms of our supply reliability, building resilience, when we times like this come, pandemic and natural disaster come at the same time, of course, the black storm, uh, we are able to continue to grow our business. So as a whole, um, our business is going to grow positively, but not as strongly or in the past, but we can need to enjoy uh, some reasonable growth right, over this period of time. And uh, we can need to see that our business will continue to grow as well, but maybe at a slower pace. So with this, uh, I continue to uh, you know, be mindful, I'll be mindful of the environment that's in Europe. Um, how Thanks very much, Eugene. I'm sorry to have to inform you that uh, the audio was terrible just now. I think the connection from, from where you are is, is quite bad. So uh, I'm going to try to summarize a few of the points that uh, that you I heard you making, whatever I could could, could understand. Uh, I think uh, it's taking potentially a slightly longer term view when it comes to investing uh, in supply chain uh, uh, to, to sort of ensure that if future disruptions are, are likely to come, uh, we don't try to address it when the disruptions come, we try to make sure that the, the preparations and the, the security and stability of the supply chains are robust enough to meet uh, current and, and most importantly, future challenges. Uh, and also I, I picked up that uh, you feel that, you know, while there will be growth going forward, um, we should expect it to be a little bit patchy, a little bit slower than, than historically, uh, but there's still a slightly cautious optimism when it comes to, to the outlook for the future. Um, in the meantime, I don't know if it's possible for you to see if you can work on the connection a little bit, um, and we'll try to come back to you for, for some, uh, some thoughts uh, during the Q&A and during the panel discussion as well. So uh, without much further ado, uh, thank you very much to the panelists for um, your opening remarks. I think what we'll go into is a, a few questions that I have for, for everyone. Um, we'll do that for maybe 30 to 40 minutes before we throw open um, to the Q&A from the participants. A gentle reminder to everyone, if you want to ask a question, please uh, type in your queries into the Q&A. You can find the button at the bottom of your screen uh, and we'll get to your questions during the section in about 30 minutes time. Um, so if I can now turn to uh, Tishin, and uh, you know, sort of posing um, the same question that I, I framed to Selena and if you want to build on some of her, of her points as well, um, how concerned are you with other challenges uh, beyond what we know of the pandemic and the geopolitical situation we see around the world, um, especially as they pertain to supply chain security or insecurity as the case may be, food, energy, vaccine securities, um, and this notion that, you know, the, the tension between reshoring or onshoring to address um, security issues as it pertains to those particular sectors, how does that actually frame the way that you analyze uh, different markets, uh, whether it's east-west or emerging? Thank you, uh, Nick, uh, for extending the question. And I think I'll, I'll add to what um, Selena have um, kind of uh, shared earlier. Um, so we are really living in a, uh, two different, there's two different world. One is um, rest of the world and there's one China. Uh, uh, China, obviously, uh, unlike the rest of the world, is opening up completely uh, amidst, you know, COVID with vaccines and, uh, you know, in selected places, even no masks, right? Um, and uh, China is still dealing with a zero tolerance policy and, and that is uh, putting a hamper on the economy. Um, and China actually have relatively low inflation rate. They are trying to reduce interest rates, uh, pumping up the money tree supplies into the economy. Um, but from what I can feel on the ground, um, a lot still has to do with COVID. 
um, because uh, today, you know, I was in Shanghai a few months ago. In uh, I, my my home is in Shanghai, so April I was locked down in the city, and now today, you know, you have Chengdu and few other cities in China that's in lockdown. So this lockdown mechanism is actually making it difficult for people to spend, uh, to travel, and it's actually dampening the confidence in in the economies, which I think will take um, probably through the 20th um, uh, Congress, which is sometime in October 16, and following that, there may be more clarities as to what uh, the new policies might be, how China is going to open up. Um, so I think that that probably is the biggest uncertainty for China. Um, and I think to touch on this um, onshoring, reshoring, food safety, energy, um, this, you know, triggered by many things, including um, the U.S.-China relation and Ukraine-Russian war and, and all that stuff. Um, it's happening as we speak. Uh, in my view, um, you know, since 2001, China joined WTO. The world is very globalized, highly globalized. Our supply chain is highly interconnected, whether it's semiconductor, food, uh, even, you know, solar panels. 90% of the solar panels are built in China. 90% of the power batteries are built in China. So even if you want to decouple, uh, it's not that easy. The whole ecosystem has to shift. Um, you know, I was talking to somebody um, in TSMC uh, over the weekend, uh, uh, one of the senior management. And even with the chipset from the US trying to relocate um, the whole so-called semiconductor ecosystem uh, into the US, it's not easy. You need um, cheap water, you need cheap electricity, you need PhDs that run three shifts to make the, the supply, the whole ecosystem come together. So while I think that uh, we are in this sort of rebalancing, uh, reshoring act um, that many countries are and uh, tr trying to do, uh, it, is, it is difficult. And um, I think the, the concern I have is not the direction we are in. The concern I have is the effort that is being made is prolonging this uh, reconstructing of the uh, supply chain, which will create more friction rather than reducing the friction. So that is a bigger issue. So politics is driving a lot of the friction and this may be a prolonged uh, situation. It's not a half year, one year thing. This may be a three year, five year, 10 year thing. And that's the scary part. Um, and I think as businesses, we, we have to figure out the, the direction. I mean, where we invest, if you have predictable direction, you actually can get growth back. I think the other thing that Selena touched on is this um, cost of capital. With the rising interest rate, money is gonna become more expensive. So investing, uh, is going to be more expensive. So all these is going to make it a lot more difficult uh, for um, investors and even businesses to get that capital uh, to reinvest and grow their business. So with that, I'll, I'll pause and I'll pass it back to, to Nicholas. Thank you so much, uh, Dijin. That's really good. Before I come to Eugene uh, for his thoughts on some of these issues, I wanted to uh, turn to Selena and build on the points that uh, Tishun just made there, um, this situation uh, domestically within China and the impacts things uh, that they are doing and they're planning from a policy perspective um, might have on, on sort of broader issues. And I wanted to contrast it with the stance uh, as it pertains to ASEAN. Um, we've talked in the past about significance of ASEAN as a unified global market. It could be one of the biggest economies in the world. Um, and we hear most of the views from within ASEAN is towards uh, continued unity, uh, uh, preference for open rules-based regional economic integration. And if we contrast that with what Jishin was just talking about there uh, in China, which is a little bit more domestic focus, uh, domestic stability, 
um, you know, sort of dealing with the COVID situation with their targets in mind um, and a focus on domestic growth uh, within the country. Do you think that <clears throat> this sort of contrast between the two views would have an impact on multilateralism uh, as we emerge, you know, as a world from, from the pandemic? Um, and, and, and what can China do, you know, in terms of driving or contributing um, to some of this multilateral cooperation, which which uh, the Premier uh, Xi Jinping has actually in the past uh, sort of advocated for and, and spoken about, um, especially in the last, you know, previous uh, four to six years as well. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Well, thank you, Francis. Uh, that's a whole long list of questions. <laughs> uh, well, let me try and unpack some of that for, for you. I think uh, ASEAN sits in a very unique position. Um, the reason why I say that is because the Western, Western perspective, I think, on China uh, will remain very challenging in time to come. So for a lot of big companies and MNCs, you know, uh, there's a lot of talk of uh, China plus one strategy. Uh, maybe now with the Taiwan uh, issue also becoming a little bit of a hot spot, it could be a China slash Taiwan plus one type of uh, strategy. So the plus one typically would sit in ASEAN. So during the pandemic, we saw a lot of uh, move in terms of the lower value added manufacturing activity to places like Vietnam, for instance. But I think over time, uh, if Taiwan really becomes uh, an issue, then you could expect that even for the higher value added manufacturing, especially on the chip side, uh, could potentially uh, also look at some diversification out of you know, being in North Asia itself. But I think that's not to you know, diminish the importance of the Chinese market to ASEAN. I mean, at the end of the day, uh, China-ASEAN integration continues to be a very big dominant force and in time to come as well. Even though you talk of polarization and, you know, China's uh, looking inwards towards a dual circulation economy, actually, if you look at China-ASEAN uh, trade numbers this year, it's been very healthy. It's been growing at double digit for the first seven, eight months of this year. And in fact, it hit a record high in July itself. So uh, I think ironically, it's actually a big push towards regional integration from here. And that's good for ASEAN. I think going forward, um, you know, for ASEAN, um, a lot of the challenges comes between trying to walk a fairly fine line because at the end of the day, uh, being smallish economies, it is very important to be united. Being united also means that uh, to a certain extent, you have to take a stance on certain issues. Uh, it can be very challenging issues uh, like Russia, Ukraine, or in terms of um, what happens, you know, if there are more political hotspots within the region itself, right? Um, I think going forward, China, like you said, presidency has been on, you know, in various forums and on paper, actually very open to multilateralism, right? But if you look at the meeting that's taking place in the US right now, the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, uh, a lot of the ASEAN economies are participating in those talks. China is very apparent uh, because it's not, uh, it's absent in that framework. Uh, that's a very amorphous framework for now. It's not really a FTA per se. It's more uh, on the level of a talk shop at this juncture. But I think it's quite clear, you know, in terms of the direction, the U.S. is trying to engage increasingly in, uh, uh, in forums that is uh, absent China, to put it very bluntly, right? Uh, China continues to try and build bridges to the rest of the world, uh, whether it's through its Belt and Road Initiative or through its engagement with ASEAN. So I think, uh, like what uh, Tsushin was saying, basically at the end of the day, you know, we live in a very globalized economy. I don't think the major economies, whether it's the US or China, can fully decouple from each other. It's just that in certain strategic industries like advanced manufacturing, AI, 5G type of uh, industries, you will see uh, some, I, I'm not sure what's the right word for it, uh, some reef, uh, ring fencing, some building of their own uh, ecosystem that is uh, independent of the other. Uh, maybe that's a theme that will continue to you know, come to pass in the next three, five, ten years, like Sushin mentioned. And that kind of means that there will be some shifts in terms of the investment and trade patterns, uh, even within the region itself. So that's something I think we have to be quite sensitive to. Maybe I'll stop that, friends. Thank you, Francis. Uh, 
Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Selena. I think we have Eugene. Sorry, Eugene, to make you keep switching platforms, but I think uh, you're on a much more stable uh, connection now. Um, we were just discussing, and Selena was just sharing a little bit about uh, potential, not tensions in the form of geopolitical tensions, but you know, sort of friction uh, between the sort of policies and the directions uh, that we see. Um, as uh, Jishun has talked about two different worlds, China and the rest of the world. Uh, and I zoomed in a little bit more on China and ASEAN and what both sides were trying to do. So from an industry perspective, do you see uh, sort of divergence between what China and uh, ASEAN in particular, or potentially the rest of the world, are trying to achieve? Uh, and what's top of mind when it comes to thinking about how that could pose challenges to, to industry? Yeah, thanks. Uh, so can you hear me well now? Perfect. Okay. Thanks. We still have to count on the primitive uh, technology here on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I try to answer, uh, make attempt to answer the best I have because because I, of the I, I lost the background just now. So, I mean to address your questions really. Uh, in our industry, the good thing, uh, uh, probably in the right side is that because China is still a net importer of crudes and petrochemical products, right? So they there's a real need for the economies, right? Empower the economies, and for our industries, uh. Whether we the question is whether we see a divergence, I would say that uh, it is selective, right? In our industry, for example, you know, in our industry, um, you know, in terms of performance specification for the product that used in China, uh, it used to be a, a mix of U.S. specifications, uh, Japan and European specification for lubricants, for example. Uh, but now China is coming out with their own China specifications, which is an uh, amalgamation of all this, uh, you know, kind of blend together, but they are kind of come out with it. So they are taking the first step, all right, in the journey to create their own specification, just like what other country did to them, or the major economy did like US, Europe, or Japan, right, did for themselves, which is the rightful step that they are doing, but in, in the difference is, is today they are accelerating that pace. That's the difference, right? Because of the geopolitics uh, that's happening, right? And uh, between US and China and the rest of the you know, countries in Asia Pacific. So they see there is a need to uh, establish their own specifications uh, for their own countries, uh, such that they, uh, they're still um, you know, in, in that direction. So they're accelerating the pace. So there's a little, you know, a little bit of divergence I see from that perspective, but in terms of products and molecules they need for the petroleum uh, products uh, is still a real need for that. So in fact, there's a silver lining I would see you know, on, in our industry because of the recent uh, uh, you know, kind of, uh, free trade agreement that we signed on this RCEP, the, you know, the regional comprehensive you know, kind of economic partnership, which consists of 10 members of ASEAN country, including Japan, Korea, Australia and New Zealand, right? And, and that set a very good platform, right? For, you know, countries to trade, right? To, uh, to have this free trade or more open in terms of scope, right? So there is a silver lining of it. And I see there is uh, uh, India dependence on those uh, in terms of uh, free trades, right? Among, you know, in the, this uh, new inceptions of the RCEPs. So I think there's a positive aspect of it. And, um, and, and it's very important for our industry because we have a world skill plant in Singapore and we ship a lot of product into China. And we also take uh, components or product from China to feed into our plants to manufacturing product, right? And ship it out of, uh, into the Asian countries. So um, so I would say it's a mix and um, we, we continue to be watchful and to address on the, you know, I think some of the bigger measure of the investment plan as uh, probably you may not have heard me properly just now. It's really we take a cautious approach, right? But directionally, China is still a strategic market for our growth in the regions, right? And we just cannot um, ignore them or neglect them, but we just have to plan it carefully and pace it carefully. Uh, what to invest, when to invest, how to invest, uh, take a much more uh, cautious step now, right? Instead that, you know, we take a you know, kind of accelerated pace in the past. So I think that is the difference, uh, you know, at least for our industry that we are looking at. Okay, I'll pass back to you, Nicholas. 
Thank you, Eugene. That's really good. Uh, very insightful and definitely a different layer of perspective. Uh, I want to turn now to uh, Tishin again and zoom in a little bit onto two sectors that is, of course, top of mind for the many investors and for many uh, people operating in the region, which is uh, tech and finance. Um, as we look at the measures that China has implemented to try to boost and stimulate growth, which you've touched on as well, um, some of them are directed at providing a stronger safety net for businesses you know, in the current uncertainty. Um, if we contrast that uh, or compare that or, or, or sort of uh, synthesize that with what ASEAN is also doing in terms of some of the points that Serena raised, um, do you see that uh, these policies from China and from ASEAN could potentially work in tandem, uh, maybe in a multilateral or, or not uh, way uh, post-COVID? Um, that could potentially affect the tech and finance sector specifically. And do you see the impact being positive or negative uh, you know, on an overall basis? Um, so let me share a little bit on, um, how, well, I think China, in terms of regulatory changes over the last one year, um, it has, you know, anti- uh, mon monopolistic ruling, um, including their data security uh, regulation um, to some of the regulation around social media. So in general, I think there's been a slew of regulatory rollouts and that has, uh, has shifted some of the uh, direction uh, in terms of what technology truly means uh, for China. Uh, so China is now uh, a lot more heavier into um, more industrial robotics uh, applications, um, uh, smart cars, EVs, uh, uh, autonomous, you know, surgical robots. Those are the things that China is moving into. And I also want to paint a little bit of a backdrop because, you know, China since uh, 2016 uh, uh, is no longer uh, benefiting from the labor dividend that it used to have. So it does have a um, declining workforce, if you will, over time. We talk about the aging population in China, the reducing number of babies that China is having. So China has a different demographic uh, challenges in the next 5, 10, 20 years. So, uh, the industrial application uh, automating, uh, including uh, uh, tools that drives productivity per uh, person is actually one area that I think China is investing a lot. Um, if you for, take, for example, um, so in the city of Beijing, uh, in, a, in, a, in a district called Yizhuang, so China is fully autonomizing cars. Uh, so robot taxis is now in play. Uh, and two more other districts will come in uh, in a matter of six months to 12 months. And you'll see that robot taxis are available now in parts of Beijing. Uh, and this is just Beijing alone. 10 other cities are uh, being uh, issuing license now to Baidu and they are rolling out these services as well. So that gives you an idea of what, where China is industrializing and innovating uh, in the years to come. I think the, the, the digitization of the Southeast Asia economies, um, we have been investing in Southeast Asia and India as well. Uh, we, are, we were one of the earlier investors in Grab, but digitization is at a different level. Um, we also need the engineering resource uh, from, uh, from around the world. Um, Grab for one actually have engineering uh, research uh, engineering development centers in Seattle, in Beijing, in India, because you need to leverage on those engineering capabilities to digitize some of the uh, solutions that you built or to, to engineer the, some of the solutions that you built. So I think in that sense, the tech uh, finance landscape in Southeast Asia, there's, there's a strong, co there's a strong um, flow of talent back and forth between China and Southeast Asia, India and Southeast Asia. And that's where Southeast Asia is leveraging a lot uh, in building out its uh, tech uh, economy. So that I, I think is what's happening. With that, I'll pass back on to you, Nick. 
Thank you. Thank you, Jishin. That's really good. Very insightful as well. Um, the next question I have after we've sort of address challenges and potential, uh, you know, things that we can be a bit more optimistic about. Uh, is also a question that has come in from uh, one of our uh, audience members. Uh, and uh, it's largely to contextualize the impact from, from COVID, from inflation, from geopolitical threats like wars, supply chain disruption, policy and political uh, conflicts. Um, and then the, the question is a short question, but maybe not an easy one to answer. Do we expect a global recession or, or, or depression anytime soon uh, and why? And maybe I'll put that slightly tricky question to the, to the economists uh, among us, uh, Selena, to take a first step at answering that. Thanks, Nick. Actually, if you don't mind, um, before I jump into the recession story, I just wanted to add a little bit uh, to the earlier question about implications for the tech and finance sector. Um, actually, for China, I think there's good news and there's bad news. Maybe I'll start with the good news first. Actually, if you look at the recent reform push in August, um, the Chinese Ministry of Commerce is actually easing uh, restrictions to encourage more FDI. So what they will do is that they will revise their industry catalog to include more high-tech industries. So foreign investments would be encouraged, you know, in certain areas like advanced manufacturing, scientific, technological innovation, etc. So actually they're trying to attract more uh, investments, especially into areas like in the central and western, north, uh, eastern part of China. So overall approach, I think China remains very much open to foreign investors. But on the other hand, um, and this is probably uh, not so good news, huh? in the meeting uh, for this uh, Central Commission for Comprehensively Deepening Reform, that's quite a mouthful, but basically what President Xi said is that they want to strengthen the leadership of the party and the central government over innovation, right? even though they acknowledge that the market has a role to play. So I think the uncomfortable truth may be that the role of the big government is going to be more active going forward in some of these key uh, strategic industries. So for foreign investors, it may be kind of like, a, you know, you have to accept a new reality. So I think there will be a kind of like a new equilibrium found, um, you know, within the Chinese space where there is a role for foreign investments, but you have to accept that there's going to be a bigger government role in terms of the regulation and in terms of the innovation space as well. Okay, moving on to the recession risk. Um, our base case is not one for a global recession per se, but there are clear uh, alarm signals going off for, you know, like what I mentioned for the Eurozone, for the UK, which looks like they are really on the brink of a recession because of what's happening with the energy crisis. The US themselves have already experienced a technical recession in the first half of this year. Technical meaning that two quarters of sequential slowdown, but they are not expected to be in a full uh, year recession yet. Um, the reason why I say yet is because um, the Fed is quite, uh, like I said, obsessed with raising interest rates and getting inflation, which is currently running at an eight to 9% handle back down to the 2%. Um, and if needed, they are willing to go into overdrive, meaning that it will continue hiking rates until they cause the downturn. So they are at risk of recession. But for China and ASEAN, we are expecting positive growth this year and next year, even if it's uh, below trend growth. So at this juncture, it's going to be still very much a very uneven, uh, very risky type of growth environment. The risk really is that one of policy mistakes. Policy mistakes from central banks who over tighten and thus drive the, their economies into a downturn. Policy mistakes potentially on also the geopolitical front, uh, whether it's by accident or by intent. Uh, I think these are the really big risks going into 2023 itself. So slightly, um, I wouldn't say depressing, but slightly uh, worrying outlook there. Can I turn to both Eugene and Tishin to get your thoughts if you have any uh, that, that either uh, agree or might be slightly uh, different to, to the, the factors that Selena have highlighted? Yeah, so maybe uh, I would like to add on to what Selena mentions. You know, uh, first is uh, generally from the of my industries, right? Uh, uh, at least for my uh, the sectors I'm in, um, you know, for uh, my company is looking at a similar kind of um, landscape or view that they have in terms of uh, recession risk. Um, 
and uh, you know, it's still you know in Asia Pacific we continue to remain a positive outlook, uh, but at a much slower pace, right? And much slower pace. Um, so with that, you know, um, in in terms of China, right? Certainly, uh, because we are in the industry that uh, link very closely to transportation and infrastructure building that drive our requirement for our products. Certainly in China, the COVID, uh, zero COVID policy have an impact, okay? At the same time, and uh, the liquidity issues, you know, and, and I'm glad that China now is cutting interest rate, uh, try to free up some liquidity. So, you know, um, in a commercial sector, you know, they, they can buy, the customer can buy, right? So, so there's a mixed impact and, and we continue to be watchful uh, in terms of the, the the situation for the next few months along uh, leading up to the end of the year and that you know wow the cycle is really the meeting they're going to have in China right in the mid-October right so there's a one sign post and then subsequent then that I know we take it from there but I know we, we are remain to be uh, very cautious looking into the situations and see how it turn out and pan out that's, yeah. a, that's a great segue for me to turn to Jishun because Jishun, you, you uh, raised the, the issue of the upcoming meeting, October 16th or thereabouts, wherever, wherever we can expect it. Uh, how do you see the global environment, especially this sort of recessionary risk, uh, playing out in, in terms of uh, what it means for, for that particular meeting uh, and the broader sort of policy outlook uh, for China at the moment? Um. Yeah, I, I think that um, a big part of this um, recessional risk, at least I, I think overall for China, the economic risk um, has to do with COVID. That's a big part of the risk. Um, COVID, um, like I said, it has an impact on businesses in general. It has an impact on, on spending, on travel, uh, on supply chain. Um, therefore, inflationary pressure. So it's it's a it has a very deep impact, and I think the big question ahead for for China is how would it um, open up and coexist with COVID? Because the re the rest of the world already did. Um, I think if there's anything um, as a lead indicator that we can try to observe is Hong Kong. Uh, um, Hong Kong, um, you know take a lot of his policies and uh, support, you know, with support from the Chinese leadership or government. Um, and that Hong Kong is trying to open up end of October. Um, uh, Hong Kong has a big event in November, uh, rugby seven aside, there's, there's events going on that Hong Kong is actually trying to open up. And that may be a lead indicator for us to see uh, for China as well to see how the open up could evolve um, with the COVID spikes and everything. I think the, the big part, the big challenge for China is the healthcare system. Uh, how would the healthcare system undertake an opening up and outbreak of COVID, um, which the rest of all kind of gone through. So all these things are things that um, China have to go through and will have to observe. And like I said, that has a bigger impact on what the economic um, uh, on the economic momentum for China and therefore uh, has a sort of domino effect or triggering effect on the rest of the world. Um, I agree with Selena, I think you know on US, I think the, the other thing I would add about US is that it, it's kind of because US actually has very low unemployment rate. Um, employment rate is actually very high. Uh, uh, but it really, but if you look at the jobs that is available uh, versus like a lot of the tech companies are not hiring very much. The tech companies are actually slowing down their hires. So it is the job construct uh, that is changing in the US. It is the, uh, the labor force that is uh, uh, missing uh, in the economy today. And that's causing some of the friction and challenges as well in the supply chain. So I think um, US is you know, doing its own rebalancing act in domestically uh, in lieu of this whole economy um, challenges. And uh, I, you know, like, like Selena said, I think they're trying to control the inflationary rate 
but they have to also be very careful that not to over strangle the economy. That's, that's very interesting. Thank you for, for shedding light on that particular perspective as well. Um, before we go into the last couple of questions that I have, Zishun, um, if I can just ask a follow-on question. You, you've highlighted quite clearly that you believe the COVID effect will still be the major determinant of, of the China outlook in the, in the immediate future at least. But, um, you know, Selena mentioned uh, as well that uh, there seems to be, a, at least on paper, uh, support for the idea of multilateralism originating from Beijing. So do you think that there's a place um, or there's any bandwidth within uh, China policy to think about multilateralism? Or is it really just going to be a very domestic COVID-focused uh, emphasis going forward, at least in the immediate future? No, I think China will want to embrace multilateralism and I think China will want to open up. And Selena has mentioned that uh, China is trying to um, you know, attract more foreign direct investments uh, into the country. Um, so in, in many ways, it, and it is, it is trying to uh, promote uh, trade across the region. Um, but like I said, the, the biggest hampering effect is uh, the COVID policy. I think, I think that is the um, uh, G20 summit coming up in, in Indonesia. Uh, and many of the top leaders are going. And from what I, from what I know uh, as of now and could change uh, that the presidency is going. And so you'll see how um, I, I think there is a desire to work with the world, um, but there are, you know, each of the members going obviously has got its own agenda and different uh, considerations that they have to work out. But I think the desire is there. That's a, that's a really good update and also makes it very relevant for the upcoming meetings uh, that we're going to see. A lot of things are happening in Southeast Asia towards a little part this year as well. So I think we can certainly keep an eye on that. Um, before, we've got, a, we've got a few really good questions from our audience, but before uh, I, I throw it open to, to, to the questions from the floor, um, I just want to do like maybe a quick fire round from everybody's perspective. Um, one, of the, one of the topics that's quite 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 trending now, and, and Tishun, you already sort of alluded to that in describing the current employment outlook in the US, is the notion of Industry 4.0. Uh, I know it's not a very new topic. Uh, people have been talking about it for the past couple of years, but at the same time, uh, you know, it's because of COVID, there seemed to have been a bit of a pause uh, on, on, on this notion of Industry 4.0 and the transformation in that direction. Um, but maybe I'll start with Eugene and then get thoughts from, from the other two uh, speakers. Um, how can in companies use Industry 4.0 to boost their recovery uh, from the current uh, challenges, difficulties, pandemic, you know, and all the different factors, the difficult factors that we've talked about so far? Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for uh, the question. So um, I think for our industries, uh, really, uh, at least for my company, you know, during these periods, uh, we are trying to simplify work for our employees, right? Because they are going through these multiple challenges that are very stressful. Uh, and then uh, we also try to help them to improve their uh, effectiveness and efficiency. So digitalization is the journey that we've been embarking on and we continue to accelerate that process, right? So the Industry 4.0 is, is, is one of those, uh, you know, our digital strategy to help to improve and uh, enhance our, uh, in terms of the employee competency so that they can do more higher value work, right? And leave those mundane routine works, repetitive work you know, to the robotics, right? And, uh, and to the AIs you know, to, to handle it, right? So, and, and that is how we are trying to structurally shift in terms of the, the skill sets and the competency of employee um, you know, in our business so that uh, we can capture, you know, uh, uh, the business of higher values, right? So certainly it helps and we are uh, accelerating that, that pathway and, uh, you know, it's a, it's a journey. But, you know, for us, because we have been in a conventional 
uh, oil and gas industry for so long. And then, uh, you know, we are probably a little bit uh, slow in that area. That's why we are accelerating our pace, right? Thanks. Pass back to you, Nicholas. Thanks very much, Eugene. Um, I think that's also uh, a really good sort of addition. Uh, now, I wonder whether Selena and Tishun, you have any thoughts on Industry 4.0 from a more broader macro perspective? How important a factor would it be uh, in the in, in sort of the recovery? Um, Selena, would you like to, to take a stab at that? Okay, sure. I have always said that one of the silver lining in a sense from the pandemic is that it actually really accelerated the shift to a digital economy. So, I mean, these days, even grandparents are like very adept with your phone with uh, ordering food or grocery delivery services, right? But I think generally we do see, a, a, you know, a change in terms of the work patterns, a lot more people adopting hybrid working patterns, uh, more companies going asset light. And I think in terms for manufacturers, logistics uh, remain a very, very big uh, area where there can be improvements to be reaped if you adopt uh, you know, Industry 4.0. So if you use big data to do your analytics, you have uh, insight into how you can make decisions better, you know, to forecast demand, to manage your inventory supply and inventory distribution, that can also be very productive. If you can use real-time data, you know, in terms of your delivery processes, you can use, uh, you know, AI to try and map, you know, some of your uh, models to give you better results. You can reduce some of the manpower, uh, you know, that uh, Eugene mentioned that is required to do the mundane and repetitive stuff. So I think if if you look at the finance industry, it's uh, quite clear. A lot of the chatbots have taken over the hotlines. And I think maybe in time to come, uh, you could have, uh, you know, chatbots replacing all the panelists on this panel discussion as well. <laughs> yeah, I think the bigger risk is for the moderator. I've heard that, you know, in, in, in the media space, they are preparing uh, AI avatars that can uh, take over the role of news presenters. So I think moderator, not too far away. Panelists, <laughs> I still think it's going to be quite tough. Um, <laughs> maybe maybe a, a, a quick thought from you on, on the Industry 4.0 trans, trans, transition, transformation, uh, and, and how this could potentially uh, factor into a broader recovery. Um, I, I think both the, Eugene and Selena have touched on like digitization is part and parcel mm. of the full recovery. And like, Sadina mentioned COVID accelerates the digitization and behavioral shift across consumers, small businesses, and enterprise, large enterprise. It does fundamentally change the way we work. Um, more people may be having this, uh, you know, work from home. Uh, so more companies are having this work from home policies where you can balance between home and office. And so office utilization could go down. Um, the type of office space construct could change. So it means a lot in terms of uh, productivity gain, um, efficiency gain in terms of office space usage, labor, uh, so time usage, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but there in lies uh, to, to Salisner's point about the chatbot, the voice board, we invest in some of these companies. Uh, it also, um, have, it will create some dislocation because the jobs will be lost. Uh, I mentioned about uh, these uh, robot taxis in Beijing. Um, so if imagining uh, all taxis are going to be robotized, you don't need taxi drivers, right? So there are uh, dislocations. What does this dislocation mean? Um, probably new jobs will be created, but in what area, in environment, in climate, in sustainability. So there are new developments. And I think that it is something that, you know, ESG is now part and parcel of our, our I, I guess, daily life companies, boards. Um, I mean, a couple of boards, we're always talking about ESG. Um, and how would this sustainability goes is important, not just for the economy, but for the community and for, in, in, in many cases, for the country. Uh, so I think uh, there is a lot that needs to be done uh, post-COVID uh, with the digitization trend that we are seeing in uh, re relearning, retraining, uh, and you know, new jobs creation. 
uh, in the next you know, five, 10, 20 years. Okay, that's, that's certainly a, a very useful perspective as well. And we've covered such a broad range of topics already. So as I feared, we are eating a bit into the Q&A time for, for the audience. Uh, again, a quick reminder to the audience, if anyone has questions, please use the Q&A function. Uh, button is at the bottom of your screen. Um, but I'll turn now to some questions uh, and I'll, I'll, because they haven't specified which speaker they would like to address a question to, I will open it to anyone who would like to take a stab at it. Um, maybe a very pointed one that, that, that might be easier to answer first. Uh, there's a question on when will the zero COVID policy in China end? so that people-to-people -people exchanges and business can resume, uh, presumably in the way that, you know, people, businesses, both inside and outside of China, uh, would want to, to see happen as well. Um, Zixin, you've talked a little bit about that. I'll leave it to you whether we want to take a stab uh, at that particular question. It's a bit of crystal ball gazing, but you know, any thoughts on that? I wish I know. Um... Uh, honestly, on, honestly, I don't know. Um, uh, it, it's it's a balance that the leaders have to weigh: uh, economy uh, uh, versus the health system or the health of the population. So it's something that is is beyond <laughs> beyond me. So I wish I knew. I, I appreciate the point you raised earlier about how Hong Kong might be a uh, uh, you know sort of a test case. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah to, to see how uh, uh, that potentially uh, shapes up for the rest of China as well. Selena, in, in all the indicators that you're taking a look at and monitoring, any, any hints, any clues? Well, I think um, I would suggest that there won't be a, a very sudden pivot away from the zero COVID strategy. Uh, they may ease, uh, I think, gradually over time. Um, a lot of people is hoping that after the 16 October uh, MPC meeting, they will announce some easing. I think I'm, I'm hopeful uh, for two reasons. I think one, you know, after that big meeting, the political transition uh, process may be smoother from there. So when the dust settles, I think they may turn their minds away from the political issues to refocus on the economy. And I think secondly, also, I think in terms of the implementation, implementation risk, it's also likely to be lower. I mean, in the run-up to this big meeting, you know, there's a lot of uh, speculation about whether the lower rank uh, government officials were too busy worrying who their new bosses were going to be to really focus on, you know, uh, implementing some of the stimulus measures. So now that the senior lineups are being finalized, hopefully they will, you know, refocus on what needs to be done on the business and economy side. Yeah. So I totally agree with what Selena and Mr. Fu is saying. I think it will be a mixed bag is to be watchful and I, it will not be totally drop off, but it will be a transition. So I think it's too important to look at those side posts, all right, the October you know, meeting. And then, you know, what Mr. Fu Chisien mentions, right, is about the, the Hong Kong as well. Yeah. Okay, that's, uh, that's a good point of view as well. Uh, I want to turn now to another question. Um, and Eugene, maybe this is something you can kick off as well. Uh, it's, for, it's for the business community. And it's basically a question of how the business community views and potentially um, desires to see uh, in terms of stability uh, in and outside of China. I think that's quite a broad question. So I would frame it in the sense that, you know, if we are, Seeking stability, right, which is what the title of our webinar is today, Striving for Stability. What does that stability actually look like um, in a global context, uh, in, in the two worlds that, that Dishun mentioned at the start, right, the China and the rest of the world? So from, maybe I could pose it to you in the form of a wish list, if you, if you were hoping to see stability, um, presumably everybody does. What does that look like from, from, from the, the sort of private industrial sector? Uh, in and outside of China. Yeah, thanks. And I think it's go back to normal, right? So our wish list will be go back to globalizations where we have multilateralisms, right? Where geopolitics is not that intense, right? Especially with the big majors like the China and US and certainly the protracted war between Russia and Ukraine will kind of come to a stop, right? And come to the end. Um, yeah, so we really uh, need a stable environment and that is defined by 
uh, the the politics, right, as well as the economies, right. Um, yeah, I and and then we have a stable environment to to work together to to develop a better you know future uh, for the world, right. So um, that will be my count as mentioned. That will be my wish list, right. And for the you know business community in China and outside China, so in Asia, pursuing any part of the world. Um, you know, we just have to learn together to work together, uh, you know, globally, uh, you know, to progress the mankind, right? So, yeah, so, so multilateralism is good, you know, have a stable, you know, kind of uh, uh, politics, right? And, and that will be my wish list, right? Zixin, would you agree, uh, you know, from an investment perspective, you know, what, what does stability look like for you? I, I guess everybody hopes that zero COVID policy will be lifted. But as you said, you know, it's hard to predict when that's going to happen. Uh, anything on a wish list that you would add to, to what Eugene said? Well, I think Eugene wished uh, pretty comprehensively uh, for us. Um, so, yeah, you know, I think businesses thrives on a stable environment. Um, predictable environment. So you know when you invest, you, I mean, I'm an investor. Um, so I think about risk all the time. So, and I think of uh, investing as a mathematical equation. The more variables you have, the, 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 you know, the risk becomes higher. So because the, each of these variables represents a risk, market risk, technology risk, people risk, and then macro risk, right? So today the macro risk is a high factor. Um, and it's really, really hard if you have um, macro risk, regulatory risk, geopolitical risk all added together to invest. Um, coupled with a relatively uh, high cost of capital environment uh, today, uh, it makes the investment calculation or the calculus quite different. So that's kind of how we would think about it. Um, so in that sense, I think that's a, it's a wish. Um, I think the reality though, is that this sort of unstable environment will be here for a little while. <laughs> uh, at least in my mind, uh, you will be here for a couple of years. Is it two years, three years, one year, two years? I don't know. Uh, because we have to observe and look for signposts along the way, uh, but it will be here for a little while. Okay, very good to know. Selena, maybe from a macro perspective, uh, what do you wish to see for in terms of stability, since we are talking about striving for stability? Well, I think it's very hard to assume that we're going to get uh, stability uh, as what we expect from the last twin years or so going forward, especially on a geopolitical front. I think some of the new reality is that we have to live with uncertainty and volatility or the VUCA well, you know, that was mentioned earlier. But I think what I would like to look for really is that you don't have tit for tat type of retaliatory measures that's happening. If you remember uh, what happened during the Trump uh, era, um, I think as long as there are clear uh, rules of engagement, I think that would be very helpful and beneficial to economies and uh, firms. I think one risk actually for uh, politicians is that they also have to manage the people's expectations. I mean, even in China itself, even though it's a central government, I mean, they also have to meet uh, the rising expectation aspirations of the Chinese people. So they, I think for the Chinese people, they also have hopes of returning to some form of normalcy, you know, life, being able to travel, being able to, uh, you know, assume, uh, I mean, you just look at what's happening uh, on the ground now, right? They are in trying to tell people to minimize travel during the mid-autumn festival and during the golden week holidays in October, right? So it's a bit of a tricky balance, I think, going forward. So we have to see how long more they can keep this up as well. I think the moment when China actually eases uh, travel, um, it will be very beneficial, I think, to the Asian markets that welcome all the Chinese tourists back. But I think for firms, really, you know, the more nimble you are, the more agile, the more you embrace uncertainties and you're able to cope with changes, the better you would be in this uh, VUCA world. Yeah. 
So to add on to what Selena mentions, uh, it's really, you know, uh, in a business, it's really focused what you can, what is controllables and what is uncontrollables. You can't change the macro environments. But what you can work on is really focus on those business essentials. Uh, you know, try to build resilience, right, and reliability in your business such that and because this will help you to navigate through and prevail through these very uncertain periods, right? Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. That's, that's a really good sort of overview of what different aspects, uh, different, different perspectives uh, and how they view, you know, stability that we might all be striving for. Um, we are almost out of time. Um, there are two remaining questions and I will just maybe try to combine it in one. Uh, I leave it to the panelists to see whether you would choose to take up the questions or if you have any sort of closing thoughts for us. Uh, because the questions are a little bit, in one sense, a little bit broad and in the other sense, a little bit specific. Um, you know, one pertains to better relations between China and the US. Uh, how important would this be for uh, that stability that we have been talking about, that we are, we are positioning as a goal that we should strive for? Um, and then ostensibly, uh, just uh, I guess this is a specific question for people looking at China currently as a, as a destination to, to work and live in. Um, that, is there any advice from, from the panel? And I, I guess this uh, Zixun would be the best person to, to talk about this, having sort of straddled life uh, both East and West. Um, you know, if people were thinking about uh, working and living and moving to China currently, uh, any thoughts or, or advice for that? Uh, given that what you have shared, I think there might be some uh, warning, cautionary tone. Uh, so maybe I will, I'll ask Zixun to take the, the second question first and then I will open the last, uh, the, 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 the first question, which is about US-China relations and what needs to get better um, to both uh, Eugene and Selena, and also Tishin, if you would like to take it on as, and as sort of your closing thoughts as well. So Tishin, I'll start with you. Okay. Well, um, I lived in China for 15, 16 years, and, um, and I've seen the transformation of the country. So it's, a, it's an amazing experience. Um, I guess the you know uh, if one wants to come live in China, uh, I think it's certainly a, a fascinating country, very very diverse in culture in in many ways. Um, until you are in the country, north and south, east and west, completely completely different. Um, so um, you know I do encourage uh, young people to go experience China, work in China. Uh, learn from China and vice versa. It's it's good um, experience that you can carry uh, with you uh, in your uh, career and work life um, elsewhere as well. So so that's always. But you know, COVID obviously is a uh, difficult. Um, so we have to wait for this COVID thing to be over, maybe in months or years. So, but you know, something that we have to. Um, the, the gate has to open so that the friction is lower. Yes, that's a scary thought. Okay, I, I have no idea. That's why I say <laughs> you know it could be it could be it could be months. It could be years. Um, and I, I I meant years as in like one to two years. Um, I agree with Selena that it's a gradual process. The question is how gradual. Uh, what trajectory would they take uh, to open up the country? Uh, yes. There is a lot of stress on the economy. Uh, it's a stress on the economy versus stress on the healthcare system. So it's that balance that they have to strike. And definitely, especially as, as Selena mentioned, the potential for a virus X as well. Uh, Selena, before I come to you, Eugene, any, any thoughts on the questions or any closing thoughts? Oh, so I'll try to address the first question. I think that is the how important is the relationship between China and US. I would say, I don't know, for our industry, especially uh, Chevron being a US company, is very critical, right, in terms of how it guide us in terms of our investments uh, together with China. So I'll give you an example. Before the COVID, right, 2018, I believe that is during the Trump uh, you know, administration at the same time, uh, there is a trade war going on. So for example, the product that we ship from US into China is about 6% import tax. Because of the trade war, you go up to 35%, right? right? And, and it's, it's, it's 
is kind of prohibitive right, for us to do business in China. So that is something that is, is says uh, uh, the strategic importance of the relationships, right? So, um, and, and if the US and China, you know, did not, you know, it, hopefully they improve, right? And, and then this uh, accelerate their pace in terms of their relationship. If not, you know, what we are afraid and concerned of, you know, if this take, uh, you know, the relation go for the south, and then that may impose trade war, and then you will create a you know a prohibitive uh, you know kind of environment for business, right? For our business, so so, but I continue to uh, maintain optimistic, right? That you know the two great giants, right, and you know, will find a way to work this way. But you know, go back to Jishin's mentioning and Serena mentioning, it's a gradual process. So we just have to be constantly uh, watchful and be agile uh, to the situation, how it developed and pan out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, Thanks. that's great. So, Selena, we started with you and we'll give you the last word as well. Uh, any final thoughts uh, or any responses to the, to the question or questions that were posed? Thank you, Nicholas. You're so kind. <laughs> I think at the end of the day, you know, I don't want to be, sound too bearish. I think uh, I would look at the numbers, hard data over the noise levels. I think political noise levels are going to remain elevated. But actually, if you look at the trade numbers, you look at the investment numbers, like what I mentioned earlier for China, for ASEAN, actually, they are fairly upbeat. So I would say that it's uh, still a fairly uh, upbeat picture for regional integration. I think for the major economies, what I would hope for is that they look for areas of cooperation and engagement and growth rather than just focus on competition. You know, so this could be you know non-controversial Asia uh, areas like climate change. You know, fighting climate change, and I think ASEAN actually can play a very pivotal and important role to try and strengthen engagement and cooperation. So whether it's through RCEP, whether it's through the CPTPP, or even this uh, uh, elevated uh, ASEAN FTA or IPEF, I know it's a lot of acronyms, but I think it basically kind of reinforces, you know, ASEAN's uh, engagement level that uh, we continue to support uh, multilateralism and that it can be continue to be a growth driver going forward for Asia as well. So maybe I'll stop here. Thanks. Fantastic. That's a really good uh, way to end. And uh, we're out of time. We we're overshot by one minute, which is quite good for me. Usually I'm always a bit later as a moderator. So I really thank uh, uh, Tishin, Eugene and Selena for not just the insights and the, the conciseness, but taking us through a topic that is so sprawling. Uh, and I think we've managed to go into particular issues with a certain amount of depth as well. So we've covered breadth and depth at the same time, which is really not easy to do in just a, like a one hour plus sort of uh, time frame. So uh, I, I, I can't speak on behalf of the audience, but I certainly learned a lot. And I think based on the questions, uh, we've seen a great level of interest from our participants as well. And I'm sure they've benefited a lot from, from your insights, your perspectives, but also the experience on the ground, uh, both from a very macro perspective and investment perspective and, and of course an industry perspective as well. So uh, I would encourage all participants to join me in the virtual clap for our participants, uh, Mr. Puti Shin, uh, Mr. Eugene uh, Ng, and of course Mr. Linia Ling for uh, your time and, and your deep insights as well. Uh, really appreciate uh, having the chance to, to moderate for all of you and on behalf of SICC and, and Business China, thanks so much for your time. Uh, I would like now to, to turn to the organizers to see if there's any final words, if there's anything that needs to be said. Peiling's camera is on, so I will turn it over to you uh, for, for, the, for, the, for the wrap up. Um, no, I actually, I think it was a wonderful session. So once again, thank you to all our speakers, Tishin, Selena, Eugene, and thank you, Nicholas, for moderating this. And of course, uh, to our partners, SITC, thank you for making this happen. I think it has been a very high quality, wonderful session. And of course, big thanks to all who made time to join us at this webinar today. So with that, um, I guess it's, thank you. <laughs> and, and I agree with the last speaker. Thank you all so much. Really enjoyed the um, webinar. Um, Love the insights uh, and the breadth and depth of knowledge really came through. And thank you, Nicholas, for being a great moderator. Thank you.
A pleasure, and hope to see everybody soon, maybe at the Future China Global Forum, organized by Business China, coming up soon. And, and thanks once again to, to everyone, speakers and participants, for your time today. Hopefully, see everyone soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.